Welcome back to the Welding Answers channel. Today we're diving into a topic that's a constant source of discussion in metal fabrication shops worldwide, the relationship between engineering and the shop floor. There's often a noticeable disconnect. Welders frequently find themselves frustrated with requirements and instructions handed down from engineering departments. This isn't just about minor annoyances. It impacts productivity, quality, and ultimately your company's bottom line. In this video, we're going to explore this from the welder's perspective. We're covering six things welders wished engineers knew about welding. And stick around, because in a future video, we'll flip the script and discuss what engineers wish welders knew. Let's get into it. 1. Accessibility is king. Engineers design complex, structurally sound weldments, and on paper, they look perfect. But have you ever actually tried to weld that intricate joint in a tight corner or behind a gusset with only an inch of clearance? Welders frequently face the challenge of executing welds in incredibly tight or awkward spaces. What looks elegant on a CAD drawing doesn't always translate to practical accessibility on the shop floor. Before finalizing a design, consider the physical act of welding. Can a welder comfortably reach the joint with a welding gun or electrode holder? Is there enough space for proper torch angles, proper contact tip to work distance, and a clear line of sight? Sometimes a slight design modification, like a small relief cut or a different assembly sequence, can make a world of difference in weld quality and efficiency. 2. Preheat is more than just a number. Preheating is a critical step for many higher carbon and alloy steels. It's essential for preventing hydrogen-induced cracking and ensuring proper mechanical properties. Engineers rightly specify preheat temperatures based on material properties and code requirements. However, the reality on the shop floor can be a bit warm. When a welder has to spend hours working in close proximity to a part preheated to 300 degrees Fahrenheit or higher, it creates an incredibly challenging and uncomfortable environment. This isn't just a comfort issue, it can lead to welder fatigue, reduced concentration, and ultimately affect weld quality. While necessary, understanding the practical implications of prolonged exposure to preheated components can lead to more effective strategies, such as breaking down large welds into smaller sections with cool-down periods. 3. Welding symbols are a language, speak it clearly. Welding symbols are the shorthand of the shop floor, conveying critical information about weld type, size, location, and other supplementary details. When they're clear, concise, and correctly applied, they streamline communication and ensure everyone is on the same page. But when they're not, it's a recipe for confusion and costly rework. Inaccurate, ambiguous, or even contradictory welding symbols can bring production to a grinding halt. Welders waste valuable time trying to decipher unclear instructions, leading to delays and potential misinterpretations that compromise quality. A solid understanding of current welding symbol standards like AWSA 2.4 and consistent application of these symbols on drawings can save countless hours of questioning, redos, and frustration. 4. Process selection isn't always one-size-fits-all. Engineers often specify welding processes based on theoretical deposition rates or general industry practices. While these are important considerations, the best process for a given application involves a deeper dive into the shop's actual capabilities, the specific joint configuration, and the overall production environment. Just because a process offers a high deposition rate doesn't mean it's the most practical or efficient for every job. For example, submerged arc welding is incredibly productive, but it's limited to flat and horizontal positions and isn't ideal for short, intermittent welds. Similarly, specifying gas tungsten arc welding for high-volume structural steel fabrication might achieve high quality, but it will dramatically slow down production compared to a more appropriate process like gas metal arc welding or flux cord arc welding. Consider factors like available equipment, part size, required joint preparation, and the welder's skill set when specifying a process. 5. The real-world impacts weld quality. While theoretical calculations and ideal lab conditions are crucial for design, the shop floor is a dynamic environment. Variables like fit-up, material condition, and even ambient temperatures can significantly impact welding outcomes. Poor fit-up, even seemingly minor gaps or misalignments, 
can drastically increase the time and effort required to produce a quality weld, often necessitating larger welds or multiple passes. Understanding the impact of material imperfections like rust or mill scale on weld integrity and the importance of clean surfaces is crucial. Even seemingly minor details like varying travel speeds or inconsistent contact tip to work distance can affect the final weld appearance and quality. Designing with a practical understanding of shop floor tolerances and environmental factors can lead to more robust designs and fewer quality issues down the line. 6. Complete joint penetration versus partial joint penetration. Bigger isn't always better. One of the most frequent points of contention arises when he engineers mandate complete joint penetration welds in situations where a partial joint penetration weld would be perfectly adequate and structurally sound. While a complete joint penetration weld provides full thickness strength, specifying it universally without considering the actual loading requirements is often an unnecessary and costly overdesign. Calling for complete joint penetration welds when partial joint penetration welds suffice is like driving a tank to pick up groceries. It's overkill and inefficient. Complete joint penetration welds require more extensive joint preparation, like full bevels, significantly more filler metal, and considerably more welding time. This directly translates to higher material costs, increased labor expenses, and ultimately a much higher overall fabrication cost. Furthermore, a larger weld volume inherently increases shrinkage forces, leading to greater distortion. This distortion then necessitates costly and time-consuming rework to bring the part back into tolerance. A judicious application of partial joint penetration welds, where appropriate, can lead to substantial savings in consumables, reduced welding time, and a significant decrease in distortion-related problems. The goal here isn't to point fingers, but to foster better understanding and collaboration. When engineers and welders speak the same language and appreciate the challenges of each other's roles, the result is almost always a smoother, more efficient, and more profitable welding operation for everyone involved. If these points resonated with your experience, let us know in the comments below. And for more in-depth guides and resources on optimizing your welding operations, visit our website at weldinganswers.com and download our many free resources. In the coming days, we'll be releasing the sequel to this video, discussing six things engineers wished welders knew about engineering, so make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss it. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.